Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Coffee at Care, and this is a co-presentation between ASU Care and Arizona Opera. We are so happy to be here with you today, and we are really excited to get this program started. We're going to introduce you now to Brian Damaris. He is the ASU Artistic Director of Music, Theater, and Opera for ASU. And we're going to hand it over to him for about the next hour. Please send in your questions, your thoughts. All of our guests today will be able to see what you're saying in the chat. So please go ahead and send those in the comments. And we'll be happy to interact with you. And we'll be dropping some links in the chat also right now. So watch for those. We're going to hand it over to Brian Damaris. Good morning. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Arizona Opera for inviting me to speak this morning. And thank you to the ASU CARE staff uh, for the privilege of working with you many times. And you're always so expert and accommodating, especially during these times. Um, thank you, Jared and Caitlin and Stacy for operating sound, lights, cameras, and slides. And um, I'm sure all of you are looking most forward to the singing of our resident artist guest, uh, Terence Chinloy, tenor, and accompanied by Christopher Cano from Arizona Opera. Um, I am Brian Damaris. I'm director of the Music Theater and Opera Program at ASU. And I am a conductor and a pianist and vocal coach. I am not a researcher or a scholar, uh, but I am responsible for imparting the history of opera to many students at ASU each year in my teaching. Um, so I ask if you have questions uh, to be kind, <laughs> recognizing that I by no means have an encyclopedic knowledge. And in fact, what I'm showing you today is half a semester's worth of information that I usually share with ASU students. So we'll be cruising through it pretty quickly. And if you're here joining us, I've asked the staff to share two links, one of which is to the PowerPoint presentation that you're seeing here, some of which I will be breezing quickly through, and the other is to a YouTube playlist. Unfortunately, uh, performance rights restrictions don't enable me to share audio or video content with you through a live stream, uh, but I have compiled this playlist for you. Um, and if you go through the PowerPoint on your own later, if there's anything that intrigues you or interests you, you'll see certain excerpts highlighted in blue, and there will be a corresponding excerpt in the YouTube playlist, uh, which you can enjoy, enjoy at your leisure. Um, so if we can go to that slide that shows the, the YouTube playlist link, and uh, we've shared that in the chat. So next slide. Where did opera come from? It's a very loaded question, and I think it's hard to ask that question without wondering where it's going, because it has never been static, it has never been stationary, and all of the great operas ask, what is opera, who is it for, and where is, what is its future? Um, and most of what we know of where opera came from is steeped in popular culture mythology um, spanning centuries. So the earliest, uh, areas of the Western European culture where we saw the influences, opera, influences of opera were passion plays and mystery plays, or sacred dramas. And you can still see these performed throughout the world today. Also madrigals, both sacred and secular, which were, which were concert pieces or, or party pieces or uh, basically popular singing choral pieces, which eventually started to tell miniature stories. And then we have cantatas, both sacred and secular, also which tell stories. And then we have the theater form, which was rooted in both either tragedy or comedy, um, and the Commedia dell'arte, which is the sort of popular touring street music, uh, street theater, um, improvised theater forms. And I'm going to breeze quickly through the next few slides of Commedia dell'arte. Um, the Commedia dell'arte, which means the comedy of art, was an improvisational theater that began in Italy in the 16th century and held its popularity through the 18th century and is still performed and hugely influential today. These performances were unscripted, held outdoors, and used full props. Uh, sounds familiar, right? Just a good COVID-19 performance format there. Uh, and they were free to watch and they were usually funded by donations in the street. And you can probably see something similar to this if you go to the Renaissance Fair. In the next slide, the troupe of Commedia dell'arte uh, consisted of 10 people. Women were included as actors. They, from outside the Italy, this form was known as the Italian comedy. It featured conventional plot lines that were written on themes of adultery, jealousy, old age, and love. And um, 
pardon my, some of my typos that I'll continue to see even though I've been doing this presentation for years. Um, but as you can see, some of these themes very much in par with the opera themes that we see today. Um, many of the plots and themes were sort of based on Roman comedies and Greek comedies of the fourth century BC, and they involved, most importantly, lazzi and burle, which are jokes and gags, which we still see in a, a Broadway musical comedy today as well as opera. The characters were identified by their costumes, masks, and props, and they featured a whole slew of, of famous characters that are still featured in opera specifically. You see the Commedia dell'arte referenced in, um, in French operetta, you see it referenced in um, in pieces like Ariadne of Naxos, but you also see the stereotypes and the stock characters on which um, that were inspired commedia represented in many operas, especially the bel canto of the 19th century. So I'm going to breeze through these slides quickly to point out some familiar names and show you their costumes. We have Harlequin, or the Clown, who was one of the servants, usually acrobatic and mischievous in, Barber's, uh, in, in Rossini's Barber of Seville. That would be, for example, Figaro. Um, next, we have Brigenda, who's a shopkeeper or a servant, always out to figure out how to profit from any situation. We have the Capitano, or the swashbuckling but bold and not necessarily heroic military person, sort of like Belcore. And we have Colombina, who's usually the female counterpoint of Arlecchino, and she's one of the servants, or what we know as the Zanni. We have the doctore, such as Dr. Bartolo, who is usually appears to be a learned man, but generally this is also the person we're making fun of in the comedies. And then the innamorati, or the young lovers, uh, which is a trope that we see in so many, so many works, serious and comic. Um, then Pantalone, who is a member of the Vecchi, or the, the, uh, the, older, the older characters, usually the archetypal old miser. And then Pedrolino, I'm gonna breeze quickly, Pulcinella, Scaramuccia, Tartaglia. And then we have, and this is the chart of Magnifico, first actress, actor, witch, pantalone, etc. We have the way that these characters intersect. And even separate from the Commedia dell'arte, we, um, we see these relationships and these character hierarchies in serious opera for the next several centuries. You could even apply this format of character hierarchies to things like the ring cycle, which are as far from Commedia dell'arte as you can get. But you have the Zanni or the servants at the very bottom. They're led by the cap Capitano. And then Brigella and Arlecchino, the clown, are sort of somewhere there above the captain. They usually have some sort of love triangle or something having to do with the captain and Colombina, who's above them. Colombina is uh, superseded by Pantalone and the doctor. There's usually a witch character up there somewhere. Then we have the first actress and actor, and at the top, the Magnifico. And if you look at everything from Beethoven's Fidelio to the Barber of Seville, Marriage of Figaro, um, all the way up to the contemporary operas today, you see these relationships unfolding. So the Commedia dell'arte was hugely influential as an improvised street theater form. Next slide, we have the Intermedi. And what happened is we had courts displaying long evening entertainments of various acts, dance, chorus, singing, etc., cetera, um, usually accompanied by social time and food in these court halls. And then gradually there were these little intermezzos or intermedi, which had plots in them. They were like skits, and I would call it something like seeing something on Saturday Night Live. Well, gradually the intermedi became so popular that the intermedi from act one to act two and the intermedi from act two to act three and the intermedi from act three to act four started to have the same characters and started to create an arc. And the intermedi got longer and longer so that the other interstitial material like the overtures and the dances and the choruses got shorter and we started to focus in more on the story. So here are, again, two excerpts in blue, which if you go to the YouTube link that we'll share again later, um, you can listen to some of these excerpts. What's in a name? <clears throat> we still don't know what to call opera, and we never have. Initially, these musical stories were referred to as tragedias, opera in musica, drama, drama in musica, commedia, commedia in musica, favola in musica, and opera lirica, which is still what it's called in present day Italy. Enter the Florentine Camerata at the end of the 16th century. This is a group of artists and scientists and philosophers and musicians and poets and literati, as they were known, um, who made it a point to sort of rediscover 
and bring to the surface the, the uh, lost traditions of the Greek theater. So they imagined that the Greeks, in order to perform this theater, which they knew involved spoken word, poetry, sung material, dance, and all of the arts, um, in order to perform this and convey the text to a large crowd, this music must have been intoned in some way. So they took this idea of intonation and combined it with the modern practices of Renaissance Italy in harmony and created what we know as a recitativo, or sung speech. This was a blending of words, music, and visual arts, and dance. The theater was religious in nature and usually depicted some sort of moral message. In the next slide, we now know, we didn't before, but we now know that one of the first pieces of importance was Eurydice uh, in 1600. The, to celebrate the maris, marriage of Princess Maria de' Medici to Henry IV of France, who was not present <laughs> at his own marriage, um, the Medici family commissioned Jacopo Peri, the composer, and Giulio Caccini, who wrote choruses, as well as Ottavio Rinuccini to write the libretto for a piece based on the myth of Orpheus. So it's very fitting that we have a Greek myth um, that's told about the power of music to persuade, celebrating this marriage. It was performed at the Medici palaces in Florence. Peri himself played the lute as he sang the role of Orpheus. In the next slide, we have the person who ended up getting all the credit for being among the first Italian operas, Claudio Monteverdi, who comes along seven years later, uh, inspired and paid by the Gonzaga family to show those Medicis what it was all really about. And they commissioned a much larger grandiose affair, and they also had it published. And Orfeo, or Monteverdi bases his work on the same, on the same, um, on the same story as Eurydice, but calls it Orfeo. And here in the next slide is a, a sample of that score that still survives today. You don't want to hear me speak for 50 minutes. You probably want to hear a little bit of music. And I also know you don't want to hear me sing a lot, but I am going to go to the piano to demonstrate just a little bit of two of the features we see in Orfeo that stay with us throughout opera. One is the overture. In this case, it's called the Toccata. Next is a ritornello, or a little bit of uh, a verse that keeps returning. Um, and then the example of recitativo. So I'll play just the opening of Orfeo here for you as you look a bit at the score. The toccata starts with brass and percussion, then it's repeated with strings, and then it's repeated a third time with everybody. <laughs> is repeated three times, and then we hear the strings play this ritornello. And then enters La Musica, or the goddess of music. And pardon me, I sound nothing like a goddess. Dal mio permesso amato a voi ne vigno Inclite roi sangue gentil de regi Di cui narla la fama e ciel si pregi Ne giunge al ver perché troppo alto i se And this is a much more illustrious goddess than I, as a soprano, and not my bass baritone, coming into the court of the nobles and greeting the audience that is actually present to say, I come to you from beloved Parnassus, O oh, great heroes, noblest race of kings, fame sings your splendid qualities, but cannot do justice to your excellence. I'm going to spray the piano down here for Maestro Cano, who will play it next. <laughs> So this is an example of what we call the weapons of rhetoric or the art of persuasion. 
uh, where Baroque music is used to speak to the audience. It's influenced by the, the art of oration and public speaking. And the goddess of music is starting her persuasion of telling the story of Orfeo by placating to this audience of nobles gathered at the scene to watch the story of unfold. I teach about four weeks of a course on Orfeo, and I'm gonna breeze through it really quickly here. The story comes from Ovid's Metamorphosis, and in all the various forms of Orfeo, there's always a different ending. The ending of this one is quite happy in, in Monteverdi's sense, because um, Apollo comes in just as Orfeo is about to end his own life um, from having lost Eurydice forever. And Apollo bring, lifts Orfeo up to the stars and transforms him into the constellation Lyra, or the lyre, as L-Y-R-E, not lyre as in not telling the truth. And what we have really interestingly in Orfeo is an architectural symmetry. I think of like Greek Palladian architecture and columns, or in this case, sort of a triangle or an inverted triangle, where we start with an overture, and then we have a goddess descending to earth to talk to the, to the mortals gathered to hear the story. We begin with Orfeo and the marriage on earth, and then we descend to Hades, and we uh, get Eurydice back, we start ascending out of Hades, we lose her, Orfeo ends back on earth, all distraught and torn, and the god Apollo comes back down and lifts Orpheus back up to the heavens. So we have symmetry in the Baroque form of music, as well as in the architecture of the drama. Next slide. Um, our friend, Mr. Monteverdi, comes back several decades later in Venice, where he was composer for St. Mark's Cathedral. And along with composers such as Cavalli, Sartorio, Legrenzi, Cesti, and Monteverdi himself, we have a, a sort of um, huge period of production of operas in Venice. Now, the difference is Venice is that these are commercial arts, and this is a commercial city where opera is um, being supported by ticket buyers and producers. So the pieces become, the orchestras become a little smaller, the sets, more unit sets, they're not quite as elaborate, but what we lose in terms of the scale, we gain in terms of the content uh, that's being put into these operas that is very popular and meant to be drawing audiences in. We saw a lot more comedy, a lot more characters showing different walks of life and society. Monteverdi um, is the one composer of these that's really entered the canon, primarily due to Orfeo and the coronation of Popea. Um, but he actually wrote 10 operas with seven or more of them lost. Next slide. Um, the Venetian opera has everything to do with Carnival. This is where we see theaters built, being built specifically for opera that feature prosceniums, arena seating, box offices, and orchestra seating and, and um, uh, tiered seating. The audience decorum, it would be much more like if you were going to see the Cardinals play and there you could talk and entertain and socialize throughout the evening, and you only really need to pay attention when there's a, when there's a hit or a strikeout or your team is doing good or bad or whatever it might be. Um, and then also the plot content, as I mentioned, is really being written to draw people in. So here are some more excerpts that you can um, listen to through the playlist. Next slide. We don't see many works of this time period produced, but in Rome we had similar operas. Much of the operas in Rome were influenced by the church and had more moral, moral content as well. There's an excerpt from uh, Stefani Landi's Sant'Alessio, and he also, as you noticed, wrote a Morte d'Orfe, a, a death of Orfeo, um, and these are uh, some of the Roman composers of the same time period. In the next slide, I went to um, honor some early female composers, including an incredible composer of voice and song, Barbara Strozzi, who as far as we know didn't write any operas, but wrote many great songs, arias, and cantatas, and Francesca Caccini, who, um, who was known as the singing bird, and wrote The Liberation of Ruggiero in 1625, which is the first known uh, Western opera by a female composer. I also want to point out that singing was a profession among the earliest in which women were paid the same or more than men, and that is still the case. Um, also, Barbara Strozzi has a beautiful piece here called Lagrime Mie, in which she was challenged to write a song that would move people to tears. So this piece is called My Tears, and you can listen to that as well in the YouTube playlist. Next, compo next uh, slide, we go to France, where opera was very different. Uh, we were writing with figured bass and continuo and, and the recitative style, but we had a lot more dance much bigger orchestras, choruses, and a very lavish affair. These were commissioned by the king himself, and usually the plots involved symbolized a hero, a victorious hero at the end, 
um, that ha was analogous to the king. Um, they were usually based on Moliere, and the verses were by Philippe Quinault. And there's a great film called Le Roi Danse, or The King is Dancing, that talks about the relationship between Louis XIV and Lully, his uh, court composer. In the next slide, I have some more um, composers of the French Baroque, specifically Jean-Philippe Rameau, who wrote a famous treatise on harmony in 1722. So now, as you can see, we're getting into the early 18th century here. Um, which is good because I've been talking for about 20 minutes. I have 20 minutes to go, and I'm one quarter of the way through uh, the history of opera as we know it. Um, but most importantly, what was also going on around the turn of the, the 18th century, here in the early 1700s, were, were pieces of comedy, usually one acts and short, because audiences were favoring comedy and not so much the dramas and tragedies surrounding these noble heroes. And um, as you did in the day, if you were a literary figure, you would persuade and argue with your audience through papers and news media. And there was a famous Carrel de Buffon, which was between Rousseau and Rameau, arguing over what belonged on stage more, drama or comedy, and if comedy had any place in the operatic stage in particular. In the next slide, I'm again going to breeze through all of this, but you see differences between the Italian and French versions of opera in the first hundred years, and you also see differences in the early forms of opera as well as in the late. For example, what we know as a ternary form, the ABA song form, where I sing material A, and then I sing material B, and I go back and sing material A with ornamentation, became an expanded rondo form in the French which is A, B, A, and then a C material, and then going back to A. So we still have the ternary form, but it's expanded with the rondo. Um, we have a lot more dance in the early Italian and French, not so much in the middle Italian, and then a lot more in the late French. We have prologues, which become the overtures. We have large casts early on, which become small casts later on. Large orchestration early, which becomes small later. Choruses, no choruses. Duets become ensembles. They're usually functioning as finales. Um, and then we have a lot of star singers in, Ital in Italy, where most of the drama is based on the, the role of the singers and the actors themselves. And then France, much, most of the material in the operas is based on opulence for the king. Another interesting thing about this time period is often you would see performers, uh, a performance where each performer is actually performing in their own language. So even if you might be going to see an Italian opera, you would see some singers singing in Italian and German singers singing in German and French singers singing in French and many interpret, interpolating their own arias. Going on, the big trade of this early Baroque is the prologues where we have an allegory story of three gods coming down and depicting the, the story that you're about to see unfold during the upcoming um, evening. Moving along, the Arcadian Academy and Opera Seria uh, comes in and uh, a group of poets led by Metastasio and Apostolo Zeno, and as literary figures, they start to dictate the forms of what we now know as Opera Seria or serious opera. Um, and they were sort of guided by the humanist philosophers of the time. Um, we still aren't calling this opera. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that we call it opera seria, opera buffa, drama giocoso, azione teatrale, drammatica, borletta, drama eroi comico, which is sort of comic but heroic at the same time, et cetera. So we still don't have a name for this. Um, we see, going to the next slide, that we see the formation of a three-act libretto, no dancers, six singers, Everything performed by treble voices, uh, with some exceptions of the basso profundo. We still have arias in ABA form, and we are writing the text in what's called short verse, or blank verse, versi sciolti, where we have syllables of uh, prime numbers, usually sevens and elevens or fives. Um, and everything in the opera was built around the singer, including the plot, to the, to the extent that no singer ha would have to sing their aria at the same, uh, two arias in succession. There would be some reason in the story taking place that would get the singer off stage, or maybe they would fall asleep while other singers sang their material, and then they would come back and sing the other aria. Going on. Um, now I'm going to point out some of the diversity, as I saw one of the questions came up, um, of the opera, and so the main influence of this form comes from Italy, but the Brits were doing their things too. Inigo Jones produced French masks and designed Covent Garden. Ben Jonson's Lovers Made Men includes Italian recitative. 
Uh, Sir William Davenport produced dramas with music by many different composers. John Blau writes a Venus and Adonis, which is known as the first English language opera with a female librettist, Afra Bain, or possibly James Wind and Anne Finch. Uh, and Henry Purcell writes Dido and Aeneas for an all-girls school in 1689, incorporating Italian-style recitative hugely influenced by Cavalli and John Blau. Thomas Arne revives opera in the 1730s, including comic opera. Going on, in Germany, we had the first aria, a uh, first opera in German, also by Jacopo Peri in Florence in 1598 called Daphne. And some could argue that this was even the first opera before his Eurydice. Um, Italian opera is mostly popular in Vienna and throughout Germany and Austria and Prussia, but again, the, singer, the actors would usually be singing in their own language, um, despite it being an Italian opera or German or otherwise. I'm going to continue along because there was Baroque opera in Spanish in Latin America at the same time. It was a result of European colonization. But we even see, for example, in the Philippines that in the first year or two of Zarzuela in the Philippines, um, you had European colonists writing those operas by the third year, you had native Filipinos writing Zarzuela in huge form, and it is actually a, a Zarzuela is recognized in the Philippines by UNESCO as a national heritage art form. Um, so at the same time we're talking about Europe, you see Mexico City premiering uh, works by their first indigenous opera composers, um, and also Brazil, Mexico, Venezuela, Uruguay, Argentina, and Peru all see more in opera in the 19th century, particularly Tarzuela. And most of it is based on the historical conflicts between the Europeans and the indigenous people. Going on, um, I do have some slides in here about Tarzuela because it's difficult to um, ignore it from the canon and its huge influence. And probably the biggest influence here is that it incorporates spoken text. And the spoken dialogue actually rhymes um, and we see this idea of the spoken text in the Zarzuela, which originated in Madrid, but again is uh, all throughout the Spanish-speaking countries, um, influencing the German Singspiel and ultimately American musical theater. In fact, many of our most well-known opera singers today, such as Montserrat Caballé, Placido Domingo, um, are all, all got their start in Zarzuela or, or from families that were great Zarzuela singers from the 1940s and 50s. Um, I'm going to keep going in slides to get to George Friedrich Handel, um, who started writing operas in Hamburg, goes to Italy and writes Agrippina in Venice, and in 1711 goes to London to write his first London opera, Rinaldo. For Handel, opera is very much a, conver a commercial venture. He starts the Queen's Theatre, the Haymarket Theatre, and Covent Garden. Um, he writes librettos with Metastasio of the Arcadian Academy, uh, Emmanuel Hayim and Stampilio, uh, other librettists of men and letters, not composers. One of the big things that Handel did in the Opera Seria was turn the, the um, it sort of kind of took over as a composer. The Opera Seria was really kind of dictated by the librettists and the poetry, and Handel, as a great concert composer that he was, sort of lifted up the importance of music in the compositional process. He wrote 42 operas, many oratorios, and many of which were both. Uh, sometimes the oratorios were written to be performed in the cities that were uh, led by the church and to get through censors, and then other times they were sort of restaged later um, as, as operatic pieces. And interestingly enough, in 1718, he writes Asus and Galatea in English with John Gay. And in the next slide, I have some information on the singers that, um, that Handel writes for. Uh, particularly the castrati, and this is really just to illustrate how important the singers were in, the, in dictating the creation of these works. Going on again, Handel's singers, all of his sopranos, and the next slide, um, his most famous con contralto, Anastasia Robinson. And then, next slide, we get to talk about Faustina Bordoni and Francesca Cuzzoni. Um, these were two prima donnas for whom Alessandro and Admetto were written, with both of them featured. And in Alessandro, Bordoni plays the role of Rosanne and has one extra aria than, than um, Cuzzoni. So there's this big public rivalry between the two of them. So one year later, Handel writes Admetto. Interestingly enough, we don't really know either of these operas as part of the canon. And he reverses that. He makes sure that he gives both women the same number of arias. In the next slide, you see right around the same time, 
uh, John Gay and Johann Pepusch write The Beggar's Opera, which is often hailed as one of the first English language musicals. It's based entirely on pop songs by many composers pulled into one story, and it's talked about, it's featuring the work of, um, basically the, the working person, the working, working class man, and pointing out the problems with political structures. And in this prologue to The Beggar's Opera, uh, John Gay actually references uh, Cuzzoni and Bordoni. He says, this piece I owe was originally writ for the celebrating of the marriage of James Hunter and Molly Lay, two most excellent ballad singers. So there we have a spoof on Italian opera to begin with. The swallow, the moth, the bee, the ship, the flower, etc. Besides, I have a prison scene which the ladies always reckon charmingly pathetic. As to the parts, I've observed such nice impartiality to our two ladies that it is impossible for either of them to take offense. So John Gay sort of inventing the English language musical with many other collaborators uh, and poking fun at the opera seria. The next slide is sort of a 18th century cartoon also making fun of the opera seria. I took this from Silvia Abate's book on the history of opera. And what we have here is Mr. Handel on the left peering out the window, basically looking for Cash, who all of his uh, followers are swooning to give him money from the door below to try to get into his theater. Meanwhile, in the middle, we see someone hauling off in a cart all the great works of literature, of, the, of, of Western literature, sort of um, making fun of the fact that the librettos of the opera seria are, hold nothing in comparison. Um, and then here in the background, we have um, people trying to get into this Academy of Art and others sort of turning in disgust in the other direction to another theater. This is also playing on the fact that Handel and Purpura had rival theaters in London at the same time and were, um, were sort of writing works for um, rival countertenors at the same time as well, rival castrati. I have a couple of slides here on the castrati that I won't get into in great detail. Um, it is one of the dark periods of um, the dark facts of opera and the abuse that, that took place in the um, training of these singers. Um, going into the next slide about performance practice, um, I just have some examples here of some of the researchers, particularly in the 1970s, who came and unearthed the true essence of what we now know as the Baroque. Um, we initially have uh, composers uh, Romantic composers like Felix Mendelssohn to thank for keeping Bach and other Baroque composers alive throughout the 19th, 19th century, but they were performing it in a very sort of romantically stylized way. And in the 1970s, um, we had Robert Donington, Nicholas Harnoncourt, and others, uh, Judy Tarling, who, who did some research to say, we're approaching this music incorrectly. It was much more improvisatory, much more text-based. In the next slide, I have some artists, and anything that appears here in blue um, is reference to the YouTube playlist that you can go listen to on your own. Um, one of my favorite is the female conductor, Emmanuel Haim, who has a performance of Orfeo and other works online as well, but this is an interview where she talks about Orfeo, um, with the excerpts that I played earlier. Going on, um, I'd just like to call attention to the fact that we sort of say, well, there was Bach, and there was Handel, and there was Mozart, and there was Gluck, and there were these sort of iconic pillars whose works entered the canon. But the reality is that they were the outliers and the exceptions, and they're just the folks whose work continued to be produced. But they had everything to do with what was being done around them. So other opera composers of the 18th century writing opera seria included Scarlatti, Pergolesi, Piccini, Adolf Hasse, and Tommaso Traietta. Going on, we have one of the most important composers and the rival to handle, Nicola Porpora, who wrote over 50 operas in less than 50 years. He was a teacher of the famous countertenor Farinelli and Franz Joseph Haydn. And he created what we know as the Azione Teatrale, which took the opera seria and made it shorter, fewer actors, no chorus, usually just a single act or two parts, and often rebound, rebound, revolve around the personal struggle of the individual to overcome hardships and become a better human, which is where we first start seeing these enlightenment themes played out on the operatic stage. Going on, our next revolutionary is Christoph Willebaud von Gluck, who in the middle of the 18th century has about enough of the opera seria that's dictated entirely by singers and is all to do with vocal pyrotechnics and ornamentation and the most absurd plots, and says we need to bring opera back to the story and the text and the drama. 
So he writes three reform operas. Um, not coincidentally, the first one in 1762 is based on the myth of Orfeo. It is less metaphor, less formulaic libretto, less secco recitative, which is recitative accompanied just by the harpsichord or lutes or theorbos, less da capo, which means less A, B, A, and less repetition. And he actually weaves dance into the plot itself so that dance plays an important dramatic element. There's a famous performance of Dame Janet Baker singing, Que faro senza Eurydice, what would I do without Eurydice? Um, and that's in the YouTube playlist as well. Um, the other important thing about this time period is we're using later 18th century harmonic inventions and conventions, and we're also using things like the Alberti bass or bum 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 to start accompanying melody over top. Um, so Gluck's operas are full of glorious melodies and less repetition in the text. Continued reform operas are Alceste, Armide, and Iphigenie and, Ot and Torrid in Paris. At this point, we have a work that's completely dedicated to drama, shorter recitatives, everything accompanied by full orchestra and the absence of dance, and we sort of fully get ourselves into the opera that influenced Mozart. On the next slide, we have another huge influence and competitor of Mozart, Mr. Antonio Salieri. Um, Salieri wrote 40 operas, more than Mozart, between 1715 and 1804, so he's writing around the same time as Mozart um, and lives beyond Mozart. He writes a work called uh, First the Music and Then the Words, and there's an aria example there called You Shall See, La Tu Vedrai. He also writes on one of the earliest version, operatic versions of Falstaff um, and, uh, in, and, and operas based on the works of Shakespeare. Then we also have Domenico Cimarosa, 80 plus operas, most notably The Secret Marriage or Il Matrimonio Segreto. And if you listen to this quartet at some point, and again, the reason I'm unable to share recordings online is due to uh, licensing restrictions, but this YouTube playlist will have this example there. Um, you'll very much hear Mozart, but it's not quite. Next slide is Papa Haydn or Franz Joseph Haydn. Hugely influential to Mozart, as was Gluck. Writes dozens of operas. And Haydn is a great German uh, concert composer. So what we start seeing, thanks to Haydn, is a lot of the traits of concert music coming into the operatic repertoire. This includes stopping for a cadenza, as you would in a piano or a violin concerto. Um, this includes much more instrumental type virtuosic writing. Uh, and this includes things like sonata form taking place on the operatic stage and how we unfold drama in terms of the form. In fact, um, American composer Stephen Sondheim has a mantra that says, content dictates form. Well, in the opera seria time, it was different. It was form dictates content. Form was the most important thing. The forms, the forms, the forms. There's even a line in Beaumarchais' original play of The Marriage of Figaro where one of the characters says the, how important the forms are. The forms, the forms, the forms. Um, but what we had with, with the late 17th century, and 18th century in particular Mozart, was saying what if we put content first and that that dictates the form. In the next slide, I will talk just briefly about Mozart as I introduce the, the aria that you'll be hearing today. So again, I've covered uh, one, about 150 years here of opera history, of which there are really only cataloged 400, give or take a few years, uh, since the advent of Orfeo. Um, and then what I have to do to introduce the next aria is get us actually to the Romantic period, because Mozart started writing in German Zingspiel and in Latin cantata forms, and then also in the opera seria form. And most of his early operas were either opera seria, based entirely on the Arcadian Academy, or um, specific one-act comedies. And then even his work with Lorenzo da Ponte, who incidentally was a professor at uh, Columbia University, with, which he, with whom he wrote Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, or Così fan tutte, which are known as the big three of Mozart and da Ponte. Um, even with them, we have Mozart and da Ponte writing very distinctly in the Enlightenment period with Enlightenment humanist philosophy. But then when we get to his final opera, The Magic Flute, which is a comedy, Zingspiel, written for a theater that was very much of and for the people and not necessarily for the courts, we have these hints of romanticism appearing in The Magic Flute. 
in the first half of the Magic Flute, we have a lot of wrestling between the heart and the mind, or the will versus love and reason. And by the end of the piece, we have more natural elements like wind, fire, and water, and sort of emotional, soulful, internal um, emotions driving, um, driving the decisions that the lead character, Tamino, is making. So with Mozart, we not only see a musical journey from the opera seria and adapting the sort of concert forms that Haydn influenced and the reforms that Gluck influenced, uh, but we also have the, um, the philosophical reforms that Mozart writes, as you can see, going from the mythological and the, the victorious hero to the victorious hero being a simple young prince who's victor victorious over his own mind and decisions that he makes for the sake of love. So before I introduce the piece, I have a couple minutes to answer some of the questions that have come in. Um, Pierrot, yes, also uh, influenced by the Comedia dell'arte. Uh, what famous composer, writer, living or dead, do you feel would have created the perfect opera to help capture the sentiment of 2020? Well, all I can really say to that is that there are more operas being written now, even since March, than there were in the entirety of the 17th, 18th, or 19th centuries. So I think our composers now, which are diverse, which include many women and many black indigenous and Latinx writers, lyricists, librettists, and composers, are the ones that are capturing what we're going through now. Um, was there any diversity during the 1600s? There, were, there are female composers uh, from the 1600s, such as uh, Barbara Strozzi and the others I recommended, Caccini. Um, they kind of disappear from the canon in the 18th and 19th centuries, but they come back in the 20th century. Um, and also, I can't emphasize enough the importance of Zarzuela and the Spanish opera in the Spanish-speaking uh, in Spanish-speaking countries as early as 1600. And just to re-emphasize there that though these were the result of, they were sort of colonial imports, they very quickly were picked up by the, um, by the native people in, in writing and, and performance. So, if there are no other questions, oh, we have a couple others. Musical theater came from opera. Is there a revival of opera singers returning to the musical theater, such as Renee Fleming and Carousel, South Pacific, Masterclass, Baz Luhrmann's Puccini's La Boheme? Colleen, you are speaking my language. I love it. Um, it's interesting you mentioned Carousel um, because there, there's a lot of history, especially Roger, around the Rodgers and Hammerstein stories of the original. We're seeing these revivals incorporate um, opera singers partially because the originals incorporated opera singers and were written for opera singers as well, particularly with Rodgers and Hammerstein. I saw the Boheme on Broadway. I thought it was fascinating and exciting, and I do think that Puccini's La Boheme still remains to this day a timeless, perfect opera because of the, the story that it that tells. It's so universal. Um, musical theater came from opera in part, hugely influenced again by the Comedia dell'arte, and also influenced by um, Operetta and Tharthuela and German Singspiel. But unfortunately, music theater also had some darker uh, inspirations, such as minstrelsy. Um, and I believe on November 18th, I am uh, presenting about 100 years worth of musical theater invention in the same spot. So if you'd like to know more about musical theater, I will venture into all of those influences. Um, in a few more weeks. So if there are no more questions, I'm very pleased to introduce our performance today. And as I mentioned, you'll hear very few traits of the Baroque here, <laughs> um, because we have an intensely romantic, that is romantic with a lowercase r, as well as romantic with a capital R, uh, aria by Mozart called Die Spielnis ist bezaubernd schön. This image is especially beautiful. Um, and in this opera, which is what we call a quest narrative, where, where Tamino, our, our young hero, is sort of on a quest for reason and good and love, um, he has just met the queen of the night, who he believes to be a good person, or actually just, he meets the, the ladies-in-waiting of the queen of the night, who he believes to be good people, and they say, the evil Sarastro has captured uh, the queen's daughter, Pamina. This is her picture, and you need to go rescue her. And for suspension of disbelief, 
They leave him with the picture with which he falls in love immediately, and he sings this aria to this picture about how he feels love, he feels this inside emotion. Um, for the rest of the opera, Tamino goes on to discover that the queen is actually the bad person and Zarastro is the good person, but ultimately in the end what wins all is his love for Pamina and, um, and, and the strength and power and will of the heart and human emotion. So uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage Terence Chinloy, tenor from Arizona Opera, accompanied by Christopher Cano.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Christopher and Terrence, for that exceptional performance. I have to say that is the first I've stood in a room with a live singer in seven months, and it feels great. I really am very thankful for that. Um, and Terrence is singing as Tamino all about love and the importance of love, and it feels a good, a good thing to be spreading out into the world virtually, even though uh, you are unable to be with us here in person. If there are no further questions, I think that about wraps it up. There's nothing I can do or say that would top that. <laughs> so thank you uh, to Christopher Cano and the Marion Roos Poulin resident artists and Terence Chinloy, to all of the staff at ASU CARE, to Arizona Opera, and um, all of you for joining today. Um, my email is briandemaris at asu.edu. You can send me any questions you'd like, or if you missed the presentation, uh, the link to the presentation with the listening excerpts and the link to the YouTube playlist with the link, listening excerpts, you may email me and I'd be happy to send that to you as well as answer any other questions you may have. So thank you again to the performers and to Arizona Opera and to all of you for being here today. And if you'd like to come learn more about musical theater, I will see you on November 18th. Thank you. Brian Damaris, our guest artist, thank you so much. We're happy to continue this very popular program that's normally in person as a virtual series. And as Brian said, our next edition of Coffee at Care will be November 18th. You will tune in at 10.30 a.m. the same way you did today. You can tune on our YouTube or Facebook Live. We do recommend that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and go on over to, a uh, to Arizona Opera's YouTube channel as well and sub subscribe to that. They did mention some of their upcoming programs and they're lovely and we are so happy to be co-presenting this series. Even though we can't be in the venue, we do feel all the love and energy from your great comments there in the chat and we hope you'll tune in on November 18th. There is another tea event as well coming up in November. That's another one of our free daytime series. If you want to tune into that, the next show will be November 17th. Those are Tuesdays at 10.30 a.m. YouTube, Facebook, tune in the same way you did. And the guest artist for that day will be the ASU Gospel Choir. Stay safe out there. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks again to Arizona Opera and to everyone watching at home. Bye-bye.